exactly right. Uh, and we'll be looking at um, the work of a, of a great author called Robert Cialdini. Now, in your handout, you'll see a QR code in the corner. And if later you, you do that, there's a podcast by Cialdini in which he looks at the difference between manipulation and persuasion. So it's not resolved, but it's a very on-point observation to make. So my shorthand answer to that is to do with your motive. What's in your heart? What are you trying to achieve here? A friend of mine said, well, why don't you call this uh, how, to, how to talk to, to girls, how to persuade women, yeah? I, if I'd put that on the advert, perhaps we would have a, a line going out onto the street. We have to redirect the traffic. Maybe we have to do it in the Hero Stadium just before Ronaldinho comes on on Thursday night. Yeah? So here's the thing, right? When you try and push somebody, what do they do? I need you to do something for me, and I'm pushing. What's the reaction? They push back. It's just it. I need you to do this, and I'm pushing you. Uh, many years ago, uh, I grew up on a small farm, uh, and we had sheep, yeah? And a little baby lambs, you know, very cute to look at. Come on in, we're all good. If anybody wants to come in, we're, 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 we're all chilled here. You can come on in. If you want to grab a corner here. Um, yeah, it's not a problem. We're all good. I've just been told not to stand behind the pole for the camera. That's the only thing. That's my only instruction. So imagine tiny little baby lamb, very cute, very nice to look at, yeah? In the first few minutes of life, it has to feed, yeah? And it's barely walking. It's tottering around. It's like me last night with a few castle beers in me, you know, and not able to walk steady. And it has to feed really quickly. First of all, there's nutrients in the milk that are special, but also it has to bond with the mother. And if it doesn't bond with the mother quickly, the mother may reject it. So I remember this tiny lamb barely able to walk and me trying to push the lamb towards the mother. Just a little push towards where it should go. And what did the lamb do? It pushed back. Its only instinct <laughs> was to resist the push. So it's true. We want people to do things, but if we push them, they can push back. So what we're going to look at today is the way of pulling people into what we're going to do. And we're going to show you, you've already got a little roadmap, and I don't like slides too much, so we can work off that. And each of these, you think, okay, that's fine, we could do that. No big, no big deal. But as you build these elements together, slowly but surely, you build a very compelling toolbox of how to pull people towards what you want. Okay? So there's a lot of science there. On that QR code, there are links to uh, some very good podcasts. As you are thinking of what we're saying today, if you think of something, hey, I know a really good book or a good podcast or a good YouTube video, email it to me and I'll add it to that link. So let's build the link together. I've got four or five pieces there already. And then email me more stuff and then we can build that link over the course of the week. It'll be by Friday, it'll all be up there. You can share your own insights. Doesn't matter what it is. So if things that occur to you, we can do that. Cool. So this is most, most to be a, a, a workshop rather than a presentation. So I'm going to get you to talk amongst each other. The setup of the room is a little bit tight. So we'll have sort of group one, two, three, and four. And you can chat among yourselves. And I'll give you an exercise to work off. Hey, fella. OK. Right, so I've got a few slides and we start working on them. So this is, a, you've got a business card with an email address. There's me there as well, if you want to take note of that. And there's me on LinkedIn. So if you want to click to me on LinkedIn, I'll then reject your, uh, reject your request. <laughs> it's how I roll. Okay. So if you want to click and, 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 uh, and the reason why that may be important is that DJ and I are over this week. Is, uh, to, we've got uh, some charitable work that we do in Chipata and in Dola and here in Lusaka, but also we're starting an uh, initiative, as, as was said, where we're going to provide some actual capital for entrepreneurs this year, next year, and the following year. So actual cash, no 
no just training or no in-kind actual, actual cash. So we'll be starting that initiative, and this week is a fact-finding as to what looks good here, what are the motives, what are the sectors, and so on. So spending this week meeting people, uh, email me, connect with me, uh, and we'll be back later this year to launch the initiative, uh, which will be funding 15 companies over three years uh, with, with uh, stage one, stage two funding. And if you've got some friends that aren't, can't make it today, send them my email address and we'll connect. Okay? Have I got your interest? <laughs> okay, that's good. And the first thing about communication is about getting attention. I just got your attention by saying, I've got some money in a, in a bag, in a ShopRite bag for you. Do I have your attention? Yes, I do. Next thing is we need to make a connection. We're here to listen. How are we connecting with you? And then is there an action? What do you do? So when you deconstruct, if you like, or pull apart good communication, it has these three things going on in it. It gets attention, it makes a connection, and it has an action. This is like so much common sense. But think back to those times. What was the action implied here? I'm giving you some information. How many times have you thought to yourself, so what? Why are you telling me this? We're in a world of so whatness, okay? So the call to action usually is the one that's missing here, yeah? So think through what do you want me to do or think differently based on our conversation. And if you think about that in advance, you have a better chance of success rather than just giving loads of information. Because guess what, guys? There's too much information in the world already, yeah? Right? We look at our phones on average 150 times a day. That's every eight minutes. And I'm sure already some of you are thinking, oh, man, I need to get back on this. Yeah? We're in a world of information overload. So all we can do with that is make sure we tag the information we're giving out with an instruction. Here's what I want you to do with this. Answer in your mind the so what question. Imagine your audience going, mm, so what? Like maybe you're doing now, so what? So you need to get to the point of relevance because there's too much stuff going on out there in the world. You've already been given the, the web uh, and internet access here so you can get online really quickly and so forth. Yeah? That's fine. That's the way we roll. This is, uh, I do a little bit of work with Save the Children in the US. And I like this. This was a pitch they were making to Amazon for Amazon to sponsor. And notice what they've done here. They've taken an Amazon package and they've put the Save the Children logo on it. So they've got some attention from Amazon, yeah? They're making a connection. We're together on this. And the call to action here is you need to sponsor with us the things that we do at Save the Children. So it's nice and simple, nothing mystical, but I can tell you, when you're looking at a presentation or a pitch deck, ask yourself those questions. Who am I dealing with? How am I getting their attention? Because they're busy people. And what do I want them to do or think differently? And keep it small and sharp, not big, vague small and sharp. We're going to keep coming back to this again and again, but I wanted to raise a flag with you in case somebody you need to get out now. This is what's behind good communication. Okay, and here's an example of a, of, of a campaign that Save the Children were running. So we're going to start with the idea of anchoring. This is a really interesting area. And we're going to do an exercise to really embed this in. Because if we understand anchoring, and we all do already, but it's a matter of making this explicit. We can make our communication really powerful. And this is particularly important for price negotiation. Okay? There is a great book out called Never Split the Difference, uh, written by an FBI hostage negotiator. And he talks about how you negotiate to get to the price you want. And the reason why, we always want to say, okay, you say 100, I say 50, let's meet in the middle, let's say 75. But if he's negotiating to release hostages, he can't say, oh, you can keep her. <laughs> Just give me those two. You need them all out. So his idea of negotiation is to take it all off the table. Don't split the difference. It's a very interesting book, very practical about negotiation. And core to that is the idea of anchoring. What do we mean by that? Okay. So the first thing is in cars, when they're selling a car, car dealers use this a lot. They look at discounting. So I'll give you a few examples, and then we'll have, an, uh, we'll have a... Here's a bag I came across on the internet. Here's a nice satchel, okay? 
Looks nice. I've, I've left it in, in, in GBP sterling. Quite expensive, 400 pounds. Looks good. Yeah, I like, the, I like that kind of satchel. I go around London on a moped, so I'd sling that on. Makes me look cool, I think, anyway. So I like that, but I'll tell you what I really like is that it actually should cost 715 pounds. That bag just got prettier. Because it's now no longer a 400 pound bag, it's actually a 700 pound bag that I'm getting for 400. The anchor point has changed. It's the same bag, but it has changed my perception. Okay, we're gonna use an exercise now to really have a bit of fun with this. But anchoring can change, you can change somebody's anchor. So how do we do that? Let me give you another example. Okay. Ireland and England. Okay, I'm gonna be like the weather guy now here. Mostly raining in Ireland, yeah? Sometimes some sunshine in London, but never like this, okay? So I grew up in a little town here in Cavan, population 10,000 people, okay? And the city is Dublin, half a million people. So when I was living here growing up, this was a big city. You go up to the big city, 500,000 people, huge, okay? So my perception, my anchor, is based on where I live in, in Cavan, and then looking at Dublin. And then I left to make my fortune, or somebody else's fortune, and I went to live in London. Population, eight million people. What do you think I think about Dublin now? Still the big city? No, Dublin is the same. In fact, Dublin's got bigger. Dublin is now one million people. So how can it be that Dublin has gone from 500,000 to one million? It's doubled in size, and now I think it's small. Why? Because my anchor point has changed. So when you're negotiating with somebody, figure out where are they coming from? What is their zone of discretion? What is their elasticity? What is their capacity for change? Because if I'm sitting here in Cavan, I'm always gonna think this is large. But after a while, if I'm sitting here, I think this is small. It's the same place. So that's the weird thing about anchoring, is the object can remain the same, but the perception of scale or cost or value can change. And if we figured that out in our minds, then all of the rest that we'll do this morning was gonna make a lot of sense, how we go and manage that. But anchoring is really important. And to do that, we're gonna have a little bit of fun now for five minutes. And those online will be posting up the exercise later, so you'll have to bear with us and I'll explain it. So DJ, should we grab the, um, the sheets? So everybody on this side, we're going to be team A, and on this side of the pole, we're gonna be team B. You're gonna have broadly the same challenge, but I'd like you to break into smaller groups. So this group here, this group here, this turn to each other and have a little chat, okay? And when you read the exercise, it'll tell you what to do. And we're just gonna spend five minutes. You've all got team A here, guys, on this side, team B on this side, yeah? Oh, so it must be... Oh. It's fine. Have you got, what's your sheet say? Team A? Um, That's fine. That's all you need. That's team A as well. That's fine. No, no, you just work together in the mini groups. Oh, I close it. So read the exercise. And what I want in the end of five minutes is a number. Give me a number. And if you have difference of numbers, then somebody get a calculator and get the average number between you. So one, one number per team. When you read the exercise, that will make sense. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, but we're also missing something here. You go to this book is not important. When you order a book, what are you paying? Shipping. Why are we selling for one thousand? One two. Like me, like me. Like me. Like me. Like me. Thank you. Yeah. How are we doing, guys? Do you have a price? What what price? One thousand one hundred. Okay. So if I offer you one thousand and ninety nine, will you take that? Yeah, you'll take one thousand and ninety nine. No. Okay. Fine. Cool. Okay. Cool. Do, do, do we have a price, guys? What, what's the price? So if, if you've got a difference of opinion, just, you know, much 850. So if I offer you 849, will you take it? Okay, so put 849 then. If I offer you 848, will you take 848? So okay, then put 848. So you need to give me a price that you say, okay, that's it. No. 850? He said he'd take 849. Okay. Okay, guys. Do we have it? 807. If I offer you 806, will you take it? Fine. That's what I need to know. Okay, folks. Okay, let's swing around. Let's swing around. Face this way. There's too much fun going on here. Too much fun. Okay. Are we all good? Okay, this team's still haggling. Come on, team, you're done. Pencils down. Okay, so these are the team A's and these are the team B's. So there is a book out there, a medical book, which you both know about for a thousand quacho, okay? That's its market value. So that shouldn't change because that's the market value of the book, yeah? That's the value, right? However, you guys are all, all students, you're medical students, you have the same book, but you have different anchor points. Now, team A doesn't know what team B's anchor point is, and team B doesn't know what team A's anchor point is. So let me read out the exercise so that the other team can hear, and then we can discover a perceptional shift between the motivations, i.e. a shift anchor. So, let me, I need my glasses for this. So, I'm going to read this out to Team B. You are a final year student and have received an extra textbook along with your original pur pur purchase. The market value of the extra book is 1,000 kwacha. You contact the vendor because you're good people. You said, hey, you've sent me an extra book. They said, it's okay, you can keep it. So, you have an extra book. Okay, and then you want to put it on, on, uh, on sale on the notice board and you've agreed what the bottom line price is you're prepared to accept. Okay, so now you see what they've been facing. Okay, now let's look at Team B's situation. Same book, medical student. You're a final year medical student and have bought a textbook, but it turns out the curriculum has changed and you don't need it. Ah, you contact the vendor, but they don't want it back. They said, no, you bought it, it's yours. Now you need to agree the best possible price you're going to want for this book, okay? Now, it's the same book, same student in a different environment. So just broadly on this, can I ask this team here, are these guys likely to be flexible in negotiation or not flexible? Why is that? Hey. Yeah, it's whatever. They've got a...
the finals near medical students. Yes. So that person has already got the book. Yes. It's an extra book, so it's Th this is you. Yeah. This is this is you, Lydia. But these guys have only got the one book, and now they don't need it. Yes, the same book. Yeah, yeah. And this is just around pricing. So, are these guys likely to be less or more flexible than you? More flexible again. Do, would you agree with that? They, they don't agree with you. They're going to be less flexible. Okay. Listen, there's no right or wrong answer. This is why we do this live. Yeah. Sorry, question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fine. Okay. Well, that, that's interesting. And, and the idea here is just to look at different motivations around the same book. But we've agreed that there may be different levels of flexibility. Okay, so let's look at this. So A1, I'm going to write down the prices here. What was your agreed price in the end? 850. 850. Okay. 850. Okay. Team two, 82. 80. And I said to them, will you take 806? And what did you say? These are tough guys. Be careful of these guys. Yeah, don't negotiate for anything with these guys. They are hard. So 807. Okay, so if you remember, it's 1,000 kwacha um, is the book value. Okay, team B1, what was your collective price? This guy, look, they're going above 1,100. Wow. This guy is going to turn a loss into a profit. And this team here? 950. Okay. <laughs> So in reality, is this really a surprise? Because these guys are trying to stem a loss. You guys are ahead of the game regardless. Okay? So the interesting point around this, and you can take the average. So the average here is what? About 820, and the average here is about 1,050. Okay? So that, if you like, in percentage terms, if you wanted to be really pedantic about it, is the shift of elasticity. You know, if we got our calculator out, you could say these guys are 10 or 15% less flexible than you guys because of the different motivation. The book is the same. So what I wanted in this exercise is to make two points, is that if you understand the wrapper or the motivation of the person you're dealing with, you can judge the flexibility or elasticity based on their anchor point. But also realize that sometimes anchors will change. Look at when I grew up in my view of Dublin, from a big city to a small city, same city, and look at this book, changed from being a cheaper book rather or a more expensive book, same book. And here's the thing, when we are selling our business plan, our value proposition, our service, I heard a lady here talking about her holiday uh, in, yes, indeed, yeah. You're very keen to sell this and let us know because we want a book. We want a book, we want to go on the Zambezi. Yeah, I want to swim with crocodiles. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's not in the brochure. Let's go swim with crocodiles. When we are talking about our value proposition, or our business plan, or our product or service, what do we do? What, what typically do we do? What are we doing here? We sell the benefits, yeah? But did you know that fear of risk or fear of loss is twice as powerful as desire for gain? Yeah? Because this is what you're also seeing here. One team has now got a loss on their hands and they're fearing it. And one has got a gain and they're more relaxed about it. And that's what this uh, exercise has shown. So what do I mean by fear of loss or fear or risk? If you don't sign with us, you're going to risk something. You're going to risk missing out. Yeah? You're going to miss out on your competition doing working with us. And we look at the use of competitive pressure in a minute to try and incentivize the prospect. Well, if you don't do it, there's people around you like you that are doing this, right? You're creating competitive tension. They're thinking, oh, my God. You know we have a, an acronym in England, and you may have it here, called F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. Fear of missing out is very powerful. And here's the science on this. And if you want to email me, I'll send you the data. It's twice as powerful as selling the benefits. 
But I can guarantee if I go through your PowerPoint slides or your website or your business case, you'll mostly be talking about the benefits. Sign up with us because, and there's nothing wrong with that, but don't miss out on two thirds of the cookie, which is about if you don't, here's what you risk missing out on. Now, of course, it's down to tone of voice. We don't want to threaten people, you know? Usually not a good tactic, but you can point out the risk of inaction or the consequences of inaction in a polite tone of voice. And guess what? As we've seen here today, it is more powerful than desire for gain. But I, I can make that point, or I wanted you now in the room to experience that point, which is what we've done. But I've nudged you as well. For this exercise to work, guess what needed to happen? This price needed to be lower than this price. Yeah? DJ said to me, what are we going to do if it's the other way around? I said, Ahmed is going to start the car, and we're going to get out of here. <laughs> yeah? I'm going to give him a sign. He starts the car, and we get out of here. But to make the exercise work, I nudged you. And again, on the QR code, there is a whole piece about nudge or strategic influencing, which is what we'll be looking at in the next hour. But I nudged you guys because I wanted the team A to be a lower price than team B for this exercise to work. So I manipulated you. But I did it for a good reason. Because I wanted you to experience for yourselves the power of flexible anchoring. So how did I manipulate you? Well, you both had more or less the same briefs, but you'll notice that I needed team A to have a low price for this exercise to work. So what did I say at the end of the exercise? I want your bottom line. When I say bottom line, what's the trajectory? It's down, yeah? When I said to team B, I didn't use the word bottom line. What did I use? I wanted your best possible price. It's the same sentiment, but I've articulated it differently. When I say best possible, the trajectory is up. And you will have heard me saying that to you, didn't you? I kept saying, can I have your best possible price? I need your bottom line. The sentiment is the same. The language is different. And you were nudged to shift these prices. You would probably have done it anyway, but you were nudged in order to make the exercise work. And I'm making that explicit now because language, as we'll see, is very important. The way we frame things is very important. And it's part of our vocabulary for persuasive conversation. Are we good with this? Are we happy? Good. Again, you can get a copy of the slides. This has been recorded, so you can uh, share it with people, and the QR code is there as well. Okay. So we've looked at how anchoring works. We're going to look at the persuasion toolbox. And this is what you're looking at in front of you now. So we're going to go through this. And again, as I said before, you might think, hmm, that's OK. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. That's common sense. But as you build two or three or four of these techniques together, you're, you're not pushing your audience, because if you do, they push back. But all of the while, you're creating a corridor and you're leading them down this corridor to the room you want them to go. And they're relaxed, they're happy to go. They're happy to be with you. People like to buy things, but they don't like being sold to. How does that work? They like to buy, but they don't like being sold to. So you don't sell them, you encourage them to buy. Okay, so how do we make that happen? So these are some elements. Some are more powerful than others. Some are more relevant to others to your situation. And as part of our dialogue today, you might say, well, hey, how do I make that work for my situation here now in Lusaka or wherever you are in the country? So we've built some space in this morning to talk about this. Okay? But these are powerful techniques, and they've been proven to work. So let's the idea of... It draws you up. So rather than you say, you say, I've been introduced by a colleague or by an expert. The person knows what they're talking about. Like, for example, it doesn't need to be that I've got a PhD in astrophysics. Do you know people, if you wanted to go and see a movie, you're thinking, oh, I need to do something Friday night. I want to go and see a movie. Is there somebody typically you would ask, thinking, hey, I'm going to ask X, because they're usually good at this. Yeah, they're good for recommendations. 
in the tipping point by Malcolm Gladwell, they're known as connectors. They connect things. They're networkers, right? So I'm going to ask this person because they are good connectors. So again, this morning, the guys talked about Bongo Hive and it as, uh, as an incubation hub. That has credibility. So where you can try and get introduced as an expert in your area and as an expert in tourism, for example, by a friend or by a colleague with credibility, you've already built up your ability to get, a, to get either a sale or to get an appointment. So rather than you talking about yourself, you get somebody else to talk you, to, about you. And we'll look at this idea again when it comes to social proof. So the first thing is the entrance you make, how credible you are, and who introduces you. And this is to do with how you network and how you get connected with people as well. So what we would say here is you will have better data in terms of your ability to sign a contract if you get introduced by somebody else who has credibility. Okay, and they say this person knows all about tourism. This person knows all about AI. Okay, you don't need to have a doctorate in the topic. You just need to be introduced as that. So the importance of events and talking about things is very important. Ahmed at the back there said that he's a coach and he's also into uh, space. Yeah, so he is credible now, and uh, you got an award from COP27. Thank you for his work in, in, in satellites. So now he has credibility. Why? Because on his website, he has COP29 special recommendation or award. Yeah? Hey, I'm not going to argue with COP27, right? If they give him an award, then that's credible for me. But look around you. It's everywhere we want. But that instantly pushes up credibility. So you're asking for third-party endorsement. Okay, so that's the first part of your journey is to seek how you can build out your proposition by getting other people to validate your proposition by saying this is good stuff. They know what they're talking about. Okay, I said you don't need to have a doctorate in the topic, but it's just you get introduced in that topic or you have a stamp or a website or an award or a certificate or something which builds it up. So it's very important to do that. Okay, so the first one is authority. The second one is reciprocity. I do something for you, you do something for me. Now, I'm not talking about you give people some cash to bribe them. Okay, we're not talking about this. That's what you do, yeah. So you go to a restroom or a toilet in an airport. And there's a person there who turns the taps on for you and gives you a napkin to dry your hands. Have you ever come across this? Yeah. Now, you're capable of turning on your own taps and getting a napkin for yourself. And they haven't asked you. And sometimes in some of the bars, whatever, they'll have some perfume or, yeah? You can spray this on as well. So that's all cool. And a lollipop sometimes as well. I don't know where that comes from. Yeah? What, what am I going to lollipop? A lollipop, some, some deodorant. They turn on the taps for you. They're not looking for anything. They, they're, they're being courteous but they're creating an environment of reciprocity. Yeah? And you're thinking, okay. Ah! What have I got? I've got 200 kwacha in my hand. Really? For turning on the taps? Yeah? But it's all the cash you've got on you. You see what I mean? They've created an environment of reciprocity. So it isn't about bribery, it's around creating a sense of obligation in somebody. So if you do somebody a demonstration, I'm going to show you our product. I'm going to give you a pilot, a three-month pilot, or a one-month pilot of our project. So you can try it out for free. But you've already created an environment of reciprocity. I've done something for you because I'm a nice person. I don't want anything in return. But if you insist, here's what you could do for me. So reciprocity is really powerful. Let me show you another example. If you write a letter, even the simple, rather than just having a standard piece, I know we don't write physical letters so much anymore, but this is just an example. Rather than having this as a generic piece, as a mail out, you've crossed this out and put in Jane, and you've put in a sticky on top of it. What am I doing there? in terms of reciprocity. Why is this here? What am I giving them? Sorry? Yeah, I'm personalizing the letter. So I'm donating my time to you by saying, I'm sending this letter out to many people, but for you, 
I'm going to put your first name in there, and I'm going to put a sticky to personalize it. So I'm donating my time for free. And this has been shown to begin to build up response. It's only a small thing, but these small techniques can make a big difference. And believe it or not, this is creating a sense of reciprocity by personalizing things. I am taking you as an individual seriously. I'm spending some time. And we know, of course, that big companies, when we're dealing with them, just treat us as a number. They have no sense of obligation. You know when you phone them up and you're on a, a waiting line, you're on the phone waiting for them to answer, and they say, your call is important to us. You're thinking, well, if it was, you could pick the damn thing up. Yeah? We are really customer focused and we care about you. But still not picking up the phone. They're not being consistent. Notice consistency is on here. We're going to look at it later. So you need to walk the talk. If you care about your customers, pick up the phone. Don't leave them hanging there for half an hour. Yeah? Simple things make a massive difference. So we need to be consistent in what we say and what we do. So in this environment, we're creating an environment of reciprocity. So perhaps just for a couple of minutes, the same groups again, think about things that you could do. And this is not about bribery. I'm telling you, it's not about that. That's later we talk about. That's the advanced course. Yeah? And we don't stream that one. Um, talk for a couple of things that you could do to create a sense of obligation in a good way among somebody you're trying to convince. So just two minutes conversation, create a sense of obligation in a nice way that you can then pull it, pull it back in again.
Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to pass around the microphone. Do we have two microphones or one microphone? We've got two microphones. I'm going to grab this microphone as well. Yeah. And you can see the slides are broadly the same. You know, the slides are the same. I haven't changed. Just the order is a little bit. Yeah. Okay, guys. Right. Who wants to grab the microphone here and be the spokesperson? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to start with team. Team, uh, is it B1? This is the guy who wanted 1100 quacha for his book, by the way. So, <laughs> so. Okay, guys, we're gonna we're, we're gonna listen here. So, do you? Okay. So, what what, what did uh, what did the conversation include? I know you didn't have much time, but just what was coming out. Sure. So we discussed quite a number of things uh, in the short period of time we've had, um, but we decided to zero in on the book that we had in the first exercise. Okay. So um, more like what uh, benefits can we add to it yeah. or incentive of some sort okay. uh, in the reciprocity that we've uh, learned. So among the things we discussed, we said we could possibly add some notes even within the book yeah. to give some guidance. You can show them the actual past papers that have information in the book. So say, for example, you tell them, okay, there's these exams that have passed. Yeah. And here are some of the pages. You can find some of the answers to this. Okay. And you can also give them the option of, I'm actually willing to help you um, possibly with one or two sessions and just guide yeah. you through the use of this book. So that's some of the okay. stuff that we've discussed that. so far. So that, that's around the idea of adding value. Um, and I think in part, just to specifically look at reciprocity, the reciprocity element of that would be to say to the potential purchaser, I know it's 1100 kwacha and I know you can buy it online for 1000 okay, but I'm going to give it to you for free for a week and then I'll take it back. So that giving it to somebody like that, but you've got one week with it. Okay, okay so we, we actually... <laughs> It's gone. <laughs> it's not going to work. So after one week, I go, where are you? Why don't you pick up my calls? <laughs> this email address doesn't work anymore. Why is that? Okay, so we actually had a discussion around yeah. that. And okay. we thought um, in Zambia, someone could get the whole book and just photocopy it. Yes, okay. <laughs> and there are a lot of ways they can go around it. So DJ, we're learning already. We're learning. We're learning. This team, it doesn't need to be about the book now, just to be about the idea of obligation. Okay. Anybody want to say anything on this team? Okay. Okay, so regarding the book, we said we'd sell it at 950. Okay. So our way of uh, reciprocating is first of all the discount. Yes. The book was going for 1000. We've kicked in a 50 quarter discount, so that's yeah. one. And then we also talked about giving freebies or freemiums. Yeah. So this includes, let's say, for example, you tell someone if you're going to buy this book at
susceptible levels of reciprocity mm -hmm. and to slowly, but sometimes you can get too close. Because you say to me, hey, Jerry, happy birthday. It was my birthday on Monday, by the way. Mm -hmm. Nobody wish me happy <laughs> There's still time, by the way. <laughs> in my time zone in London, it's still my birthday. So technically, you still have time to go out here. You know. So, um, but it, it could also feel a bit creepy as well. I think. How do you know it's my birthday? And they go, oh, you've got this gift. You go, really? So you, you need to judge the taste of it as to are you being too kind of creepy or is that broadly about getting to know each other and being appropriate? And you need to judge your, your instincts on that. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Jerry. Yeah. If I can just share one more anecdote. Sure. Um, maybe the funniest and smartest thing that ever happened to me in terms of uh, reciprocity. You know, uh, when you're driving... Um, during the rain season, if you check the front lights of your car, that cover, it can discolor. It can be yellow over time. So it was rain season, and I was about to park uh, my car. Um, the covers of my lights were yellowish. And then I saw one guy run towards my car, and then they cleaned, like, uh, the left light. I was wondering, what, what the hell are you doing? And then I got out, and then I saw it was sparkly clean, like... I just bought the card, was so new. And it's like, boss, look, look, the difference, you know, uh, this is now super clean and this is yellowish. I was like, wow, I like your solution. Can you do the other one for me? Say, like, $5, boss. <laughs> and I'm I like, like, okay, you got me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it's gonna look weird, one good light, one bad light. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so. Is this really working? It is. It's actually broadcasting okay. to the world. <laughs> so you're you're already like big, you're already big, loud a big hit in London already. <laughs> wow, you're lucky trend, me. You're trending I'm in trending. London. <laughs> okay, so for for our group, uh, it, it wasn't about the book, but we're talking about how we add value, and we looked at it in terms of uh, different scenarios. So how you would walk into a boutique. And you discover that if you compliment somebody, they're likely to buy something from, from you. Or uh, there was an example of skincare products. Where if somebody is struggling to look for something for their face, for instance, you compliment their skin tone and they're most likely to, to buy that item. And then uh, having a conversation with somebody. When you have conversations, people are more drawn towards you and they're likely to listen to you. So then they'll be able to reciprocate and probably um, get to buy into what you're trying yeah. to sell them. And referrals, and then there's the freebies that um, most people have mentioned. And the, the most important one was adding uh, like a, a value added service. Yes. So you spoke about discounts, and whilst we were having this conversation, uh, Herbalife came into... Okay. Yeah. So yeah. You, you, if you notice, no matter how much negative publicity that brand gets, there's two there's the 30-day money-back guarantee. Yeah. Okay, yeah. very interesting. And we're going to come to the idea of liking in a bit as well, and mirroring, because some of you have touched on the personal connection, which is, these are all interlinked, but we've teased them apart so that we can choose which part of the toolbox we want to use. So liking is also part of reciprocity as well. You're creating a personal connection. I'd like you to do well in your business, genuinely, because I connect with you and I know your story. I understand your backstory and what you're trying to achieve. And therefore, there's some goodwill. But that goodwill is only good if you take it to the bank and cash it. Don't just leave it sitting there. You need to get to action. Do you remember earlier? Attention, connection, action. We don't want just a warm feeling. We want them to do something with this. What is it you want them to do? Think about that. Be ruthless. Be like this team over here who wanted 1,100 for the book. Yeah? Be ruthless, but in a nice way. <clears throat> so social proof. We're in a world of hyper-connectivity. All smartphones, and I know already your smartphones are, I'm competing with your smartphones for your attention already, I can see. We'll be finished. Guys, if you want to take a quick break, uh, if anybody wants a quick break, now do it. We're going to be finished at 11 on the dot, and then we've got some, some refreshments for you. So... Social proof is so important these days, and the data shows, for example, car dealerships, people are more likely to buy a car that they see in their neighborhood, right? They say, oh, look at that car there. Ooh, I like that. I wonder how much that much be. So that idea of social proof is incredibly important. You know these days with the world of influencers in fashion, 
and in interior, and, and they present their wonderful lives. But a lot of these are hugely paid now by the brands because of the social proof that they're saying, look, you can have this life with this product in here. So the whole world of influencers is in part around social proof by apparently situating the product or service in somebody's normal life. <coughs> now, it ain't normal life, that's for sure. But it looks like their daily life. Oh, we're going on this holiday at the weekend. Let me check out this holiday they're doing. So it's become now an incredibly powerful marketing tool. But social proof works in many, many ways. Yeah? It's partly fear of missing out. But if you do stand out and you get part of the in crowd early enough, you can be trendy if you're an early adopter. Yeah? And it combines in many different things. Let me see if I can get this to work. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, let me just... Then let's talk about movement happens. <coughs> just having a bit of a dance. He's taking a risk though, isn't he? Of looking stupid. He's an innovator. Certainly in that dance style, he's innovating. He dances like I dance, by the way. <laughs> yeah, without any sense of rhythm. But he's got some followers. People, hey, that's, that's pretty cool. I'll do that. He's taking a bit of a risk, and risks like looking a bit silly. But he's got this idea, you know, and he's enjoying himself, and he's kind of doing it. They're having some fun. <laughs> So this is the difficult part, because like, is anybody going to get involved, or am I just going to be left by myself? Or we're going to have some social proof now to validate this is a cool thing to do. This goes, oh, okay, I like this. I can do this. It looks like we're having fun. Yeah. So now it's, there's a bit, a little bit of a crowd going on now, so it's less risky. You know, I can kind of, you know, I don't risk looking such an idiot anymore. Yeah. And it looks kind of cool now, you know? Yeah. It was a back <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. So this is what you want to do with your businesses, guys. Yeah. So you want to stand out from the crowd, but also encourage the early adopters to think, it's okay, come on in, the water's lovely. Because after a while, people want to join because they look like idiots for not joining in. Right. <laughs> yeah so social proof can be very powerful but you need to take a risk sometimes and then get people to follow you Derek Sivers really fantastic guy looking him up look him up he sold his business called CD baby for many millions of, of dollars gave it all to charity uh, he, he worked as a circus clown at one point an amazing kind of just different person and incredibly insightful so S-I-V-E-R-S, Derek Sivers on YouTube. Look at any of this stuff. He's a very, very cool guy, and he's the guy that supplies some narrative on, the, on this piece here. So look, look at him now. Look, look at all that crowd, all desperately trying to get to be part of the in crowd. Yeah? And they're now fearing missing out. Yeah? yeah? But it takes a tipping point. Yeah? And it takes a little bit of courage. So social proof can be very powerful. You may have seen these the, the odd time in the hotel. Basically, I think the hotel is trying to save on washing more towels. But they're really talking about the environment. And we're going to be looking at this in a bit when we're talking about framing. Is this about the environment or is this about saving on washing towels? Okay, I think it's about saving on washing towels. But anyway, what they need you to do is let them know whether you want your towels washed or not. So they've got different kinds of styles. So. Save the environment. Who cares about the environment here now? Do we all care about the environment? Okay. Who doesn't care about the environment? All right. Fine. So, so we've got your attention. We all care about the environment. Here's what we want you to do. Let us not wash your towels. But they have different styles of message. And you see here the data in terms of activity. This is the action. Right up to 50%. Most people who stayed in this room... <laughs> You're thinking, where are they? Are they still here? <laughs> I didn't check behind the curtains. Most people in this room recycle and reuse. So you get 49% compliance just by pointing out the data. We're going to look at another data point in a minute. But, but the style of messaging changes. Look at how the shift goes as well. Because you're validating the social proof. 
people who've sat in this room have done this. Why don't you? Right? And you get that extra compliance. Commitment and consistency. Do you remember earlier we talked about the, the company who cares about your, your business? They care about you deeply, yet they don't pick the phone up. Right? So they're not being consistent in their value proposition. Now, because they're a big monolithic bank or a telecom company, they can get away with it. You won't. So if you say you care about your, your customers, you care about what you do, you need to walk that talk. If you say you are in uh, the accountancy business and we will be forensically accurate in how we do it, make sure there are no typographical errors on your website. You're thinking, well, doesn't make sense. The small things make a big difference. You need to be consistent. But here's what I want you to think about, because it's not just about being nice. I want you to ask your customer or your prospect to do something for you as well. We've talked about the freemium accounts. Yeah? I'm going to add value. I'm going to bring the book around. I'm going to give it to you for a week so you can photocopy it. Yeah? <laughs> I'm going to photocopy it for you and give it for free because we're really nice people. But here's the deal. People tend not to value things that you give away for free. <clears throat> so you're, you're struggling with the ratio going on here. And you need to judge this. So don't give everything away for free. But you need to get them to engage with you. Don't leave them passive. So for example, you say, okay, we've got this, uh, we've got this product or service and we think it would be great for you. Why don't you send me an example of your business goals for this quarter and we'll show you how we can address them. And they're thinking, no, I'm not sending you anything. No, you just, you, 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 you tell me. Unless they commit to something, you're much less likely to get a sale from them. But you're thinking, hey, Jerry, you know, I risk them saying, I'm not going to do it, and you break the conversation. Here's the deal. You're not having a conversation in the first place. So if they won't send you something simple and achievable, you're not looking for confidential material. Look, but you need to get them to do something. And that commitment is the engine of your relationship. So when I was in the digital learning, I had a digital learning business. And I would say to the customer, if you send me your KPIs, We'll map our learning, we'll curate our learning to address the things you're trying to achieve. You're, this year you're trying to be uh, AI based, you're trying to be digitally smart, you're trying to be professional, whatever it might be. I know this already, but I've asked them to send it to me. Now I'm going to curate, as in I'm going to organize our system to speak directly to those KPIs. So I'm creating reciprocity here because I've dedicated some of my time already to doing this, right? Reciprocity happening here. But I'm also getting them to commit. They're saying, why do you need this? Well, because the solution is going to look so much better when it's actually fixed on the things you care about. But the principle here, regardless, because I know we're all from different walks of life and different services, unless you get them to do something for you, you're much less likely to get. And that takes courage, by the way, and I get that. And it doesn't mean that you break the conversation if they won't send it, but ask to get them to do something easy and simple. Could you send that to me and we'll take a look at it? And as soon as they say yes, now you're on a yes ladder. Now, now you're selling. Before that, you're just continuing a conversation. Now you're progressing the conversation. There is a difference between continuing and progressing. And persuasive conversation is about shifting to progress. We've gone from A to B to C, and D is kerching time. This is the money goal. But unless you get them to do something, you're much less likely to get engagement. So get them to do something simple for you. And now we've got a relationship going. Don't leave it too passive. And I understand it takes courage. And you don't want to break the line. But if you give everything for free, if you're like a puppy dog and you cover them in love, yeah, less likely to do business with you. Yeah. So maybe slightly counterintuitive there, but that's really important. And we've talked about the idea of walking. Be consistent in how you come across. Be fun to, you know, maybe, maybe not lead with the terms and conditions of your contract. I'm sending you through a 40 page contract to look at 
as the second part of our conversation. You think, well, that's not fun. <laughs> that's no fun at all, right? So be consistent in how you come across. Where, where are we, how we want to be? Okay. Liking, it's important. But that doesn't mean that you're just nice for the sake of it. You gotta be yourself. So there's some techniques going on here. One of which is mirroring. And the idea of mirroring is that you use the words they use. Right? If they use a word like ecosystem, like Bongo Hivers <laughs> likes the word ecosystem a lot. <laughs> yeah? And what they mean by ecosystem is a collection of people going around, but also as well, I think ecosystem, I think of a pond. Yeah. yeah. So we have different views of what an ecosystem could be. But be really clear that if you can mirror the words they use, you're pink, without being creepy about it, you're, you're more likely. So when you're researching your prospect, look at their LinkedIn profile, look at the things that they like, that they care about. I put up my LinkedIn profile at the beginning and I said to you guys, do you want to connect with me? Yeah. What did you notice about that LinkedIn profile? I only put it up for a second. There's me again. I had a lot of filters on that photograph, by the way. A lot of good technology involved there. What do you notice about that? Huh? You, you like my photo? Thank you. Oh, the, the behind it. What, what, what is that? What is that? That's the Ukrainian flag. I put, and I didn't do this for today. I just put that up and I noticed, oh, I've left the flag up there. So I care about Ukraine a lot. So I've put that information for free, and it's true, I do. Well, hence the flag. I'm Irish, I'm not from Ukraine. So I'm giving you some free data that you can mirror. So you look at the news today and realize that actually Ukraine is now invading or going into Russia and attacking there. That's the news. So as part of a conversation, if you wanted to, when we're socializing, you said, hey, you know what's going on today in the... Uh, Bahamut region. I will know this because it's on my flag. Now you're building rapport or you're mirroring my values. You may not care about Ukraine. I'm not suggesting you do. But if you want to connect with me, I'm offering you a corridor. Yeah? There is a tool, and I don't have shares in this, but it's a good tool. It's called Crystal Nose. It costs about $6 a month to subscribe to, so maybe Bongo High will subscribe to it and then give you free access. Yes. <laughs> you may have come across it but basically, on anybody's link...
-hmm. trying to disincentivize us, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, is this about money or is this about the environment? You think it's about money? They would say, no, we're pa Do you not care about the environment? You already told me you care about the environment. I asked for a show of hands and you didn't put your hand up. So you care about the environment. We all care about the environment. So what they've done is they framed it. See, if I said, hey, I don't want to pay the extra money, going, you don't care about the environment. You're, it's clear. So it's like, a, it's like a protective cloak they wear. So this is framing. And framing is basically an issue. And if you get people to buy into the issue, they're more likely to buy into what you have to say. So let me just go back and explain that more clearly. We've already looked at anchoring in our exercise. Okay. So anchoring tends to be quantitative. It's about money. 1,100, 850. So it's about money. Typically, it's about numbers. Framing usually is about an issue. Is This is about the environment. This is about the future of our country. This is about the safety of our children. And if you disagree with me, you don't care about the safety of our children. It's quite powerful. And if you wrap your product or service in a compelling frame, it's like a, it's like a special shuttle that will take you there faster. So you need to figure out what, what is your product really about. So your holidays down in Victoria Falls, for example, yes, it's about fun, but it's also about local tourism and growing the economy. So that's an issue. Do we care about growing our economy here? Yes. Let's go on holiday. Yes? yes? Let's spend locally. <laughs> Let's spend locally. So you see there that they have connected the two. They've connected the product or the sales proposition into an issue that people care about. And if people buy into the issue and you've cited that first, you've framed it. You've put a frame around it. Yes, support the community. So it's linked to anchoring, but we've looked at anchoring at the beginning of the session. And it's usually around money and negotiation. It's quantitative. This is more qualitative around you itself. These are powerful tools, folks, and I've left framing to the last. So the question then is, you take your product or your service and you cascade it up to the issue it's fixing. So it isn't just about your personal wealth and your personal future, because people are less likely to buy into that. And it's more about the future of our community, the safety of our children, the wellness of our planet, whatever it needs to be, yeah? You bolt it into that and you get extra charge as a result. It's like a supercharge. You need to figure that out. And ideally, it's an issue that you know this customer thinks about in the first place. Why? Because they've said about it on LinkedIn. So if you said to me, come on holiday to Victoria Falls, and we make a donation to the Ukrainian... <laughs> for, for, every, for every dollar you put in, we put in one cent to the Ukrainian things. You see, now I care. I want to go on holiday, I want to support the local tourism, and I care about it. Does that sound creepy? Not really. That's fine. It's slightly creepy. Okay. <laughs> but you see, it just, it's an exaggerated example. You see what I'm saying there? You've bolted it into something they care about. Why? Because you've researched it. Because we all care about certain things, despite appearances. We're all human. Right? We care about certain things, and framing is a really powerful way of doing it. So although I put it last, you lead sometimes with that and you finish with anchoring. So let's flip today and say that ultimately you want to wrap your product or service in an issue your prospect cares about. You position your value proposition into it and then you get to anchoring, which is around their elasticity. How liable are they to buy into this? How resistant are they? What's their motivation? This motivation was about benefit. This motivation here was about um, minimizing loss. Sort of the same thing, but the flip side of the same thing. Same book, same student, but different motivation of rapper. Okay? So as I hope you see today, we've begun to compile a series of elements that in themselves don't look that pushy, but as you begin to put them together in a considered way, they are shown to be powerful tools to get your customer to yes. And you haven't pushed them once, but you've created a conversational corridor You've created the ability, they call it uh, a choice architecture. You've architected, sorry for using that as a verb. Uh, you've created an architecture around them that is conducive to them to getting to yes. You haven't forced them to do it. People like to buy, but they don't like being sold to. So you've encouraged them to buy.
You've pulled them towards what you want to do, like a magnet. Okay? So the QR code there has got some resources, Kildini, Nudge Theory, some interesting other elements that I thought appropriate to our day. Email me anything else that has occurred to you, and by Friday we will have added that to the resource area, so we can all share in your contributions. So we'll have added that to that QR code today. Send me an email, connect on LinkedIn, because we'll be back later on in the year to launch our initiative about uh, putting some cash on the table to, to support entrepreneurs in, in Zambia. Um, and we've left a little bit of time if anybody's got any questions or you totally disagree with something or you want more clarity, please do it. Uh, and then we can take our break for some refreshments. So I've got a microphone here. You've all been very good and very talkative. And I've, we've got three or four minutes left. So any, any thought? You've got a question? Or consideration? Uh, thank you. Um, just a question. Um, I'm trying to frame my thoughts <laughs> before I ask you this. But earlier you were talking about, I think it was under commitment, um, where you mentioned that um, if you, okay, in the way I understood it, yes. um, say, for example, a client asks for your services. Yes. And you give them a sample, for example. Yeah. Um, there's risks around that it, it, with regards to what you do because you might end up giving them a, a lot, like you said, and then yep. in the end they'll just go with a cheaper yep. um, source. So then you did mention that uh, try to understand what they do and then try to, like in your case, you customize their... Yep something something so that I, I don't know what exactly it was i can't remember but you customize something yep. for them so our, that our, our it, learning our learning apparatus it, our online learning we, we curated for them. Yeah. yeah but in instances that you can't do that and yes. i can't give a specific example okay, well, how do you I, yeah. I, let, let me say to what yeah. you're saying then mm -hmm. so you're giving people a free pilot yes correct so you say okay i'm going to give this to you for two weeks can you tell me who is going to look at this mm -hmm. right because if you're dealing with just with one person Right? That's fine. And he said, I've got, I've got five people to look at this. Oh, well, well, people will like it. Well, let me, let me offer you some other customers and their KPIs. Now, will you commit to these? So you're asking for commitment. Okay. So if you were offering something for free, that's fine. They need to judge it. You need to know that if it is successful or if it's not successful, what is that threshold? Okay? And they commit to that. Okay. And it's forcing them to think through, oh, just send it on, we'll take a look at it. Yeah, no, we'll do that. And it's on its way. We've got a two-week pilot. Who else would you like to see? To, the, to broaden it out, what are their names, if possible? Because now you can research them and realize, okay, they've just sent it to their boss. Good sign. They're now opening it up. They're taking a risk with this. And secondly, what are, what are your evaluations? Or maybe we could help you with this. Could we work together on the KPIs for success? But unless they commit to those, it's just washed over them. And they may not even look at it at all. I've had many instances of customers, oh, yeah, two weeks is gone. We never looked at it. Yeah, because there was no engagement. So you need to get them to commit up front, and it takes a little bit of courage to do that. Okay, okay any other thoughts, questions, considerations? This gentleman. So I think you spoke about authority. Yes. Now, can you give me an alternative to where authority doesn't help me, or I don't have a third person to introduce Okay, so it doesn't need to be a formal authority. It can be an informal authority. So I'll give you an example. I'm trying to get a hold of Jerry online, uh, but I noticed that we've got a mutual connection. Okay? So you get onto your mutual connection saying, could you introduce me to Jerry as an expert in this area? Saying, hey, talk to, talk to this guy. He's really good on the following area. So there's an example of trying to make that connection using LinkedIn. So... It, you, that's a digital version. You may have an analog version, which is going, we are actually members of a same fitness club or whatever. Could you introduce us? And when you're saying it, saying, we're really good at this. And they've got to read it. So it can be as simple as that. So if you lack the formal COP27 
certification, which is, you know, the, the big picture, you can have something that's a little bit more informal. But it's so important to do that you walk in them with that tag. And you then need to sell yourself less because you've already got that wrapper. I think you had a question, did you? Um, I saw an NPR video recently yes. where they were talking about um, companies that produce plastics. Yes. And um, that they were basically putting the this can be recycled sign to get people to buy, but there's never any intention to have it recycled. Yes. Um, and I was just thinking to what the gentleman said initially about persuasion. Yes. Like at what point is this manipulation? Um, okay. Because now that the information comes out after so many years of you thinking that, oh, this, yeah, then, then there's now this distrust. Yes. Um, that comes up and and what that does for your company in the yeah. in the long run yeah sure so no, that's, that's, that's a fair that's... point you know you've got please recycle written on the side you're thinking well empirically nobody's doing that they would say it's not their job to recycle they've asked the customer to do it so they've abdicated responsibility but what you're saying is if they wanted to be more committed to the environment then they would have a program to go and collect for example like for example um in nespresso pods the the little coffee capsules they give you a bag with that, and you can take the bag back to Nespresso, and they will recycle for you. There's little aluminium capsules. So they're not just putting on the pack, please recycle this because it's aluminium and it ends in landfill, but actually we've got a mechanism set up. So this is back to the idea of attention, connection, action. What are you doing? And you're right. You know, sometimes you're thinking, well, they just put a sign on there just to abdicate responsibility. Um, gambling, online gambling, you know, is, is a big deal these days. And I think it's quite a, a dangerous potential for people gambling on their phone for football games in far parts of the world at two o'clock in the morning. And you see these gambling adverts going on in, in the middle of football games. And then they just say at the bottom, when the fun stops, stop. That's a bit like, please recycle. When the fun stops, stop. I'm thinking they're underestimating what addiction actually means, you know? <laughs> fundamentally underestimating the ability for people to stop because they've hooked them in so cleverly with their free bets. I'm going to give you a free bet to get you going. It's a bit like people handing out free cigarettes. Now I've got you hooked. That's what they do, free bet. They think, hey, I have nothing to lose. Yes, you've got plenty to lose. When the fun stops, stop. So on that note, let's stop. <laughs> Take a break. The good people of Bongo Hive have laid on some lovely refreshments. I can see them out there. So... Sorry, question here. Hello, actually, it's not a question. Just want to say thank you so much. Okay. I've learned a lot in terms of framing and um, more, more on framing and also consistency. Thank you. That's very good. Thank you so much, Gary and Bongo. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.